All right, welcome everybody. My name is Paul Colby. I'm director of the Intelligence Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. It gives me great pleasure to be able to moderate this seminar today on the state of Ukraine today, what's happening with the fighting and what we might be able to look forward to. And I'll introduce our panelists in just a moment, but first wanted to turn over the mic to Maria robeson Moro for some initial uh, directions. Maria? Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're delighted to have nearly 200 of you on the call already and more to come. Uh, before we begin, I do have a couple of quick administrative notes. As an attendee, your microphone and camera are both muted for the session, but please use the Q&A chat box. I see someone is using it already. And we will be monitoring all of your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best during the question and answer period to address as many of them as possible. So we'll be beginning by hearing from each of our panelists and then we'll move to the Q&A portion. So again, please make sure you put those questions in the chat. We'll address as many of them as time allows. And now we'll turn it back over to Paul to introduce our speakers. Great, thanks Maria. And then just some quick boilerplate. Uh, while this session is open to the public, and on the record, uh, recording or further use of recording is prohibited. So thank you. And with that, I'll go to introductions. So I'd like to start with uh, retired Brigadier General Kevin Ryan, former US Army. He's Belfer Center Senior Fellow and served as the founder and director of the Defense and Intelligence Projects at the Belfer Center. He's a career military officer served in air and missile defense, intelligence, and political military policy areas. From 2001 until 2003, he served as defense attache at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Uh, he's also founder of the Elba Group, a group of retired U.S. and Russian flag officers from military and intelligence fields. Welcome, Kevin. We also have with us Serhii Plohi. Uh, he's the Mihailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and the Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard. Uh, he's involved in the study of intellectual, cultural, international history of Eastern Europe with an emphasis on Ukraine. He's a prolific author uh, with some great books, among others, Frontline, Essays on Ukraine's Past and Present, Nuclear Folly, Folly A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which feels particularly relevant today, and Chernobyl, History of a Nuclear Catastrophe. Welcome, Serhii. And we also have Michael Kaufman, Research Program Director in Russian Studies Program at CNA, and as fellow at the Keenan Institute, Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, DC. His research focuses on Russia and the former Soviet Union, specializing in Russian armed forces, military thought, capability, and strategy. Previously, he was a program manager and subject matter expert at National Defense University, advising senior military and government officials on Russia and Eurasia. And he's senior editor at War on the Rocks, where he regularly authors articles on strategy, Russian military, Russian decision-making, and related foreign policy issues. I can hardly think of a better uh, uh, group of panelists to discuss the situation in Ukraine today, help provide some context perspective and a bit of insight looking forward. So with that, we'll start with uh, some uh, scene setting from Michael. We'll then turn to Serhi, go to Kevin, uh, and then we'll go to uh, discussion. Michael, over to you. Sure. So I'll offer some thoughts on what I think we've seen in, in essentially the first week of, of this war. I think that uh, it's very clear now that it was in the first couple of days, the initial Russian military campaign was premised on terrible delusions and assumptions. So it's a big miscalculation, both politically, but also militarily. The, the concept of operations they went with was essentially to try to rapidly get forces to the Ukrainian capital and to either get Zelensky to flee or to surrender and then to push small numbers of units very quickly down roads and key road junctions to take small towns and to give the sense of a rapid collapse that they were isolating sectors and the like. They were trying to avoid or skirt major cities and they were trying to avoid significant contact with Ukrainian forces. It seems they didn't expect substantial Ukrainian resistance. They didn't expect a serious Ukrainian military effort and they actually expect to get to, to Kiev pretty quickly and to be able to enter the city. And that, that was all proven wrong, I think, in the first 48 hours almost. 
Now, since then, you saw Russian forces try to resource, which is ultimately a, not a successful and unworkable strategy. Um, and they made significant adjustments about four days in. So the organization of this operation, from what I can tell early on, is phenomenally shambolic. It's very different than what analysts like myself expected, although the objectives are what we assume. They're maximalist war aims. It's clear that Russia intends to install a pro-Russian regime. And if that doesn't work, they might actually consider partitioning the country itself. Uh, and they have held most of the military power and most of the capabilities they have on the sidelines. It's important that folks understand that Russian air power has hardly been used. Uh, Russian combat aviation hasn't played a strong role here. Most of the things people thought they'd see, electronic warfare, cyber warfare, heavy use of fires, you know, outside of shelling of, of cities like Kharkiv, you actually haven't seen the Russian military bring a lot of that in yet. And you started seeing it increase after the fourth day as Russian forces were adjusting and getting frustrated. Uh, and most of Russian combat power is yet to be committed to the fight. It's actually still only entering Ukraine and entering kind of the theater of operations. Uh, Russian forces were pretty spread out, and the logistics and communications behind this operation are terrible. Uh, we're still debating why, but it's clear that it's clear that morale in general amongst Russian troops is fairly low. That many of them actually didn't know about this operation until perhaps days just days in advance, so I'm pretty shocked to find out that they're going to end up uh, conducting a large-scale military operation in Ukraine. But that's what best you can tell from, from a, a host of uh, POW interviews um, that I've had the opportunity to see. Uh, despite that, there are substantial breakouts uh, in terms of Russian uh, progress into Ukrainian territory along several acts of advance. The main ones in the south from Crimea, heading all the way across Kherson to Nikolaev and heading east towards Mediatopol and past Mediatopol now to encircling the city of Mariupol along the coast and the Sea of Azov. And the northeast as well, past uh, Sumy, heading towards the capital. And of course, uh, there is this huge traffic jam of many Russian battalion tactical groups on the way down to Kiev. It's now steadily starting to encircle the capital, and it looks like they are still focused on the capital as a center of gravity. And as the Zelensky administration, they probably do intend an assault. And we've seen already uh, days of urban warfare uh, across Ukraine, some pretty destructive use of firepower. And I would say about a day ago, the first sighting of, of actual use of tactical aviation for bombing, although still pretty limited. But you see as Russian forces are changing back and growing frustrated there, we're now seeing a reversion to the mean. Russia's a firepower heavy military. And you're starting to see a lot more use of artillery, ammo, multiple launch rocket systems and the like. All right, uh, so the, the initial campaign, I think for the Russian military in terms of objectives hasn't gone well. And this organization is raising a lot of questions uh, about, from, from the right circles about what we, what we think and know about the Russian military. But it's actually very clear that the Russian military at this stage isn't fighting as a combined arms maneuver force isn't fighting as a joint force and isn't fighting in the way it sort of trains and organizes typically. This is, you know, in, 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 in surprising to most, um, you know, when the Russian leadership declared this war and they call it a special operation, it's, it's, it is in some ways bizarre. And, and last point, they are trying to keep this war secret from the Russian public. Aspects of this suggest that not only have Russian political leadership views clearly not evolved substantially from 2014 and the way they looked at Ukraine, they actually believe that they can conduct a large scale war against the largest country in Europe and keep still keep most of it hidden from the public, right? And of course that's, that's not working out well for them, but they're keeping the bulk of this war secret. They're not even allowing media outlets to call the war, literally. And, and they've closed down quite a few media outlets uh, that were still se se semi-open in, uh, in the last couple of days. Anyway, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues here. I don't wanna use too much time. I think that's safe for, for Q and A afterwards. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, really interesting set of points there. Um, Sergey, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul, and thanks a lot for inviting me to this forum. Uh, I will try to bring a little bit of a perspective uh, related certainly to my field of expertise, history, but also a couple of comments. We'll would try to make a couple of comments that would probably fit more a profile of constructivist approach to the international relations. Uh, one thing that probably surprised almost uh, anyone who uh, really followed the, the uh, start of the war and the days and the weeks leading to the war was a long speech by uh, President Vladimir Putin that sounded like a history lecture. 
And uh, that emphasis on history was something quite unprecedented. But it also explains to a great degree the uh, assumptions, the, the expectations on which uh, the current war was launched and the military campaign is being conducted. It is quite clear from other images that, of Putin that we got on TV that uh, he is certainly completely, uh, on the one hand, isolated, uh, partially because of the pandemic. Uh, uh, the decisions that he makes, he makes those decisions, the advisors that are there are maybe helping him to, to get to the goals that he sets, but he is the one who sets the goals. And what happens in, in his head, his vision of history uh, uh, seems to be extremely important in general for, the, for what is going on, but also to explain in some of those uh, failures that that otherwise probably are inexplicable. One thing that we heard in that speech was, of course, that Ukrainians don't exist, at least don't have the right to exist as nations, because Russians and Ukrainians are um, one people. That was the late motif of the Putin's article that was published earlier. And um, also that Ukrainian state in, uh, is an artificial formation of the, of the Soviet era. Uh, the uh, point that I want to make that it's not just a propaganda tool, I, uh, following uh, Putin's pronouncements and also his speeches, I came to the conclusion that he really believes in that and uh, that he really expected that to be a very limited, as he mm, put it, military operation that would not last for more than a couple of days. And uh, um, my understanding is that him believing that was coming not only from his very peculiar way of reading history, history of the Russian Empire, and history of the Soviet Union, but also from the experience of 2014. And that is the uh, takeover uh, and annexation of the Crimea and the start of the hybrid warfare in Eastern uh, part of Ukraine, where eventually this puppet regimes called uh, People's Republics were formed. And at that time, uh, Putin was, uh, and, and his troops were really uh, welcomed, certainly in, in some parts of the Crimea. There were enough uh, people in Eastern part of Ukraine that certainly looked with some, uh, with some hope at the new regime that was coming. And uh, uh, I would say that, that that also played into the into the calculations and miscalculations of the current campaign. What happened was uh, something that uh, Putin and people around him to a degree that they have influence on the decision uh, making process didn't take into account of this uh, dramatic changes that happened in the Ukrainian society between uh, 2014 and 2022, with the um, Ukrainian national identity and, and also the loyalty to the state uh, solidifying uh, the uh, army, of course, being built and the concept of taking up arms and defending your um, uh, home and, and your homeland, which was kind of not completely foreign, but, but, but not also completely um, embraced in, in 2014 and 2015 became, became the, the foundation for the modus operandi of the Ukrainian army and Ukrainian population at large. And that is, I think, is, is a major change and the change that was not taken into account. When you look today at the videos that are coming from the areas that uh, were Putin probably counted on most of support in Eastern Ukraine or in Southern Ukraine, you see actually people in the cities that are formerly under the Russian control are going on the streets, demonstrating, protesting, chasing the, the troops out. You can hear that the, the um, um, the, 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 there is fire somewhere in the background, but they're not, they're not afraid, they're not living. And this is, this is a major, major uh, change. So what that also means that whatever happens in terms of the military operations, it would be extremely difficult, extremely difficult for the Russian forces to control 
Ukraine and to control Ukrainian uh, uh, population. Um, which brings me to the, uh, to the question about the future. Uh, the original plan, as it was described by Michael, and the way how it was um, certainly unfolding in the last few days is now dead. The idea was to take um, Kiev uh, in, in a very fast manner and uh, then apparently install the government there that would potentially be accepted probably by the rest of Ukraine. Certainly, it is not happening now. The military operations are taking place in uh, eastern Ukraine and to a degree southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine. Whatever troops and reserves are there uh, would be not enough, in my opinion, to control the, the, the territory as large even as eastern Ukraine. This is a new experience certainly for the Russian army after fighting either in Chechnya or, or in, um, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, just the, 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 the um, geographic, geographic scope of the territory and of Ukraine. And uh, I uh, would not be surprised if the uh, plan B or plan C under the circumstances would include return to the original planning of 2014, where the Russians tried to create the so-called new Russia. Um, uh, state uh, truncated part of Ukraine, or at least dividing Ukraine into Western Ukraine and into, uh, into Eastern Ukraine. What we hear about the possible candidates to lead the government of the future Ukraine, all of them would not be considered to be even closely legitimate by even by Eastern Ukraine to say about, nothing about the rest of Ukraine. So at least the, the, the people who are named now, including the former president of Ukraine who fled to Russia, Viktor Yanukovych certainly have no legitimacy at all, but certainly have zero legitimacy in, in Central and uh, Western Ukraine. So um, uh, I, I uh, would not be surprised if there would be a time also to come back to this, to this thinking and to this planning of, uh, 20, of uh, 2014. But uh, my overall impression that the, the original plan that was based on a particular reading of history, on the particular understanding of the experience of 2014, certainly is pretty much that, or at least at least is, is, is falling apart. And that means that the other side will be improvising and we should expect and expect it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sarah. Very interesting. I've got a number of questions already, but let's go to uh, Kevin Ryan for his perspective. Uh, thank you, Paul and uh, Michael and uh, Sergey for uh, setting the uh, groundwork here. Um, I, I want to start basically with Sergey's uh, last point, which is um, what is the goal, right? What is the, uh, uh, what is the acceptable objective here that Putin uh, wants to get out of this invasion. Uh, why is he doing something that seemingly uh, can't provide him with a win, uh, no matter how you draw it up or, or repackage it? Uh, and, and Michael's points that uh, even under the best of circumstances, uh, that the, the, uh, uh, the operation wouldn't deliver all the um, things that Putin has asked for from the West, um, and certainly, and as Michael's pointed out, it, the operation is not going uh, well, uh, at least from our perspective, right? Uh, and I would think the Russians too would agree with that. Um, first, uh, it's important to note, I think that this is, uh, that Putin and his leadership think that Russia has been at war with NATO for quite some time. Um, not a shooting war, but a war of other uh, means. And uh, the invasion of uh, Crimea, the annexation of Crimea, the Donbass uh, area operations, and now this invasion, further invasion of Ukraine, these are the next phases in this uh, war with NATO. Uh, and I think it's important that NATO and the US uh, reframe their um, perspective on what's going on uh, to take that into account. This is not just an invasion of Ukraine as, as terrible as that is, but it's, a, it's, it's part of a broader issue that Putin has with the West. Um, 
the uh, uh, the things that are happening in in Ukraine as a result of this are um, they include the humanitarian crisis, uh, which is uh, that term is being used now. Uh, you have uh, millions of people on the move. Uh, hundreds of thousands have crossed the border to um, uh, to seek refuge. And it's uh, easy to imagine that this will get worse. Um, uh, so this is something that's happening inside of Ukraine, which uh, should possibly impact uh, the decisions that the West and the US have made so far about what is their involvement in Ukraine. I think the US and the West should, should um, review that those decisions and reconsider whether uh, they need to help by being present in Ukraine or on our borders in different in different numbers than they they are right now. Um, another insight that uh, um, comes from what Russia is doing in this operation concerns its concept of buffer states. Uh, one of Putin's early uh, demands was that he wanted uh, um, states that were. Uh, that were not part of NATO and did not have NATO infrastructure and no military, no training, no, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, the idea of Belarus seemed to be uh, the ideal model for what Putin would want out of his buffer states. Um, but we see now that, uh, that Putin's idea of a buffer state is not like a Finland. Uh, it's more, um, it's more like uh, Russia's territory to do what it wants to do, and nobody else can come in. So the Russian military is uh, much more closely aligned uh, today with Belarus's military than it was even a year ago. And part of this invasion emanated out of Belarus after many exercises that were conducted in, in Belarus between Russian and Belarusian uh, forces. So uh, a buffer state is not a Finland uh, to Russia. It is a state that even if it's demilitarized, like uh, Putin claims is his goal for Ukraine, it only means that there's no Ukrainian military there or no Western military. Uh, it doesn't mean that Russia won't have its military there. Um, the US and NATO now have to think ahead uh, as to what they, want this region to look like when this war climaxes or reaches whatever conclusion it is. I personally agree with Sergei's uh, position that, that this could involve uh, territory on the, uh, what they call the left bank, uh, but that's because you're coming down on the river. So it's the left bank of the uh, Dnepr River, but it, it's the Eastern side of the Dnepr River. And then along the uh, coastline, which is, where they're having more success right now, uh, entering cities and taking territory, cutting off Ukraine entirely from the Black Sea, removing another state from the Black Sea and increasing Russia's own strategic position there. Um, and let me, I'm gonna try and share this now uh, uh, map just so that I can point this out and, and maybe we can have a, a visualized idea of, of what we're talking about here. But if, um, uh, if we say that um, Eastern Europe right now, uh, the, the, uh, the line between um, NATO and, excuse my fumbling, the line between NATO and Russia basically it goes along here, along the Baltic states, Poland. And then if you wanna include a NATO partner, that would mean Ukraine, right? Uh, but if you, uh, if you see that, what Putin may be going for is a, is a line that that uh, basically comes along Poland and then goes along here. That would that would allow him to take all of that would assume he's going to take all of Ukraine, 
uh, uh, another option is that that line only extends to say this area and and this area here becomes a new Ukraine or a rump state Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of problems with doing that. Uh, that, in other words, that maybe only solves Putin's problem partially with uh, forces that would be in this area. But uh, let's say he can't get everything he wants and instead he's willing to accept the big chunk of left bank Ukraine and the Black Sea. The question the West and the US should be asking itself is what is our involvement in, in this area here? What is our presence? Are we going to agree that this will be totally devoid of Western and NATO forces? Or are we going to say that no, whatever Ukraine goes in here is still an independent state and we will do business as normal with that state? Um, I don't know that uh, we've actually uh, thought that through, um, but I think it's time that we do start thinking about those things. So I'll stop there, uh, just trying to throw in some things that maybe weren't mentioned in the first part. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, look, I've got some questions for each of you and I'll try to keep, uh, I'll abuse my privilege as, as moderator uh, to, to ask a couple of them and then we'll turn over uh, to Maria. But Kevin, it just strikes me, but both in your, your discussion and then in Sergei's, as well as Michael's, no, no one sort of offered uh, an outcome which looks like Ukraine whole and free as it is constituated uh, before invasion. Um, you know, you talked about what what might be acceptable to, or, you know, what might be a, uh, uh, you know, sort of draw your lines and maps, um, uh, Kevin. You know how we should be considering how the West should be considering, you know, these particular outcomes. Uh, but I didn't hear anyone talking about an option where um, Russia uh, pulls back and leaves um, uh, leaves re Ukraine with. Uh, 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 with its uh, old borders. Okay, I'll, I'll start first. I know everybody will have an answer for that, uh, some sort of thing. Um, and this kind of goes to uh, something that Michael mentioned early on, you know, what was the plan initially? It looks like there were, there were there's evidence in the way they operated that they didn't expect to have to have uh, supply lines that were further than three days away. Uh, and uh, and uh, they expected a much quicker uh, climax to their military operation. That that uh, I I accept that. Let's say uh, I I agree that maybe that's true, but it doesn't mean that they threw their hands up and they didn't have a plan uh, that foresaw that possibility. There are 190,000 troops along the border. They don't need 190,000 troops to have a plan which relied on uh, lightning speed. A strike in Kiev and uh, uh, and the deposing of the government. 150,000 troops is a lot of firepower to put to move around your country and then put in this one place. So, what was the plan that involved 190,000 troops? That's really, I think, an important question. That I don't I don't know the full answer, but I think it's more than than what happened uh, so far. And those troops could be occupation troops in this. Uh, Eastern part of Ukraine. Um, so, uh, your question, you know, what what would uh, a whole and free Ukraine, you know, what would that what would bring that about? It would have to be the Ukrainian military by itself defeating 190,000 troops, and I don't I don't think we can as bravely as they fight and as as uh, as uh, persistent their. Um, their attempts at thwarting these advances, uh, the, I, I don't think we can expect that they will be successful in that without intervention from the West. I'll stop. Sarah, hey, Michael, any uh, comments on that? Sure, I can, I can maybe jump in now. Well, the, the um... Defeat of Russia and and the victory of Ukraine, which would be maintaining Ukrainian territory and, and sovereignty, 
Uh, I'm uh, thinking about it where the military component is just one of them. Again, uh, militarily, it would be impossible to achieve, but I don't exclude a scenario in which the Ukrainian resistance continues. The uh, war, Russian war in Ukraine, which is already uh, unpopular, becomes even more unpopular than it is today. And uh, the, the sanctions work. So in that sense, it's uh, almost like the um, solidarity in, in, in Poland in the 1980s, uh, emerging, emerging later as a winning, as a winning uh, political force. So uh, I, I uh, to a degree that I, I, I can envision that scenario. For me, it's more scenario uh, political rather than the military, but again, military is a very important component of that. Uh, continuing resistance and really, really shaping the resolve for the future, for the future political struggle. I'll, I'll just briefly comment um, and follow up on Kevin Serkis' remarks that, look, it's very clear that, as we all agree, the initial concept of operations and the political assumptions were all wrong, right? But there's a tremendous amount of Russian military power, as I said, being deployed in this conflict, and they are adjusting, they are starting to work out fixing logistics. And I saw, given Ukraine's strong you know, resistance, the fact that Ukraine's military didn't collapse, uh, the fact that the political issue didn't collapse, I saw a tremendous amount of euphoria, right? Particularly on social media. Social media tends to, as somebody was on there too, it tends to paint a bit of a one-sided vision of, this, of the battle space. Uh, but I had, to, I had to temper that. Unfortunately, as an analyst, I often have to introduce pessimism into the conversation and say, those were the first 96 hours of what is likely to be potentially an ugly and brutal war. And people have to realize this is the opening. This is still the beginning. The worst is very likely yet to come in this conflict, right? We're seeing a tremendous amount of Russian military power approaching Kiev, beginning to encircle the capital. And we're seeing a lot more Russian forces steadily being introduced into the fight. And after a pause, they're, they've adjusted tactics and approaches, and you're starting to see a new set of actually offensive in the last day, day and a half, uh, particularly in the south of Ukraine and northeast as well. And so I want to I want to both temper folks' expectations and and, and because I, I really felt like as though after the initial couple of days, given the, the nature of the Russian effort, how poorly it was organized, that people began to say, hey, Ukraine can really win the fight. And, and my view is perhaps in urban warfare, perhaps in uncertainty, sure, but, but folks should also not get too optimistic this early on that given the correlation of forces that the Russian military is going to, you know, just com completely collapse in the next couple of days. Like people also need to be realistic about the reality of how outmatched Ukraine is on ultimately on the battlefield. Thanks, Michael. Uh, look, let me ask you a question on on uh, Ukrainian forces uh, and sort of where where they're uh, where they're configured, how they're how they're adapting and adjusting. Um, so, what, I mean, one of the I mean, two questions that I've seen come out uh, are why hasn't Russia employed its air power and air assets? Where's the Russian Air Force been, both for ground support and the difficulty in securing air, airspace and air dominance, which wouldn't have seemed to be that difficult? And second, uh, I've seen very little on the disposition of the forces, which I understood kind of be the bulk of the forces, which were along the kind of the eastern line with the uh, uh, in Donbass. You know, are they simply just pinned down there? Are they waiting to be encircled? Have they been mobile? Have Have you seen, you know, large, you know, sort of transition of forces from uh, into urban areas or preparing preparing for the fight uh, that's coming rather than the fight that they were fighting for the last eight years? Sure. So one of the biggest mysteries right off the bat was why is all of Russian air power and other capabilities basically sitting on the sidelines? What we saw were essentially at the opening phases. A, a small Helleborn assault on Gusta Mill Airport. And it was clear that Russian forces were trying to seize it to introduce airborne rapidly to the city, but they couldn't hold it long enough, so it wasn't successful. And I don't say have some attack helicopter and some attack aircraft here. We haven't really seen the Russian Air Force come in. They've been using cruise missile strikes and tactical SRBM strikes to try to suppress Ukraine's Air Force, along with their own air defense. Uh, and to try to degrade uh, Ukraine's air defenses and command and control. And they've been iteratively striking Ukraine each night. And actually, they've, entered, they've clearly entered a cycle where they conduct strikes at night, they do battle damage assessment done in the morning, um, and they conduct strikes the next night, whereas the military is operating on the opposite cycle. That is, they are conducting operations and offensives in the morning, 
then it looks like pausing to assess and kind of in the afternoon and planning at night and then launching a new set of operations again the next morning, early morning of the day, typically. Um, as far as Ukraine's military, so the major Russian offenses are not the Donbass, except a little bit towards Mariupol and to this sort of very eastern edge coming out of Luhansk heading north, right, um, and punching out that way. You see what was happening uh, is that they have broken out of south in Crimea. They have tried to link up uh, both heading west and east there, west to, to Nikolaev and east towards Mariupol, and they've essentially encircled Mariupol at this point, right? That's, I think that's, that's a fair, there's, there's a fight taking place on the outskirts of the city. It's fair to say that that's, that's where the situation is now. Um, and in the east, they're advancing kind of north of Sumy, and they're trying to advance around Kharkiv. So their goal has been not to fight for major cities, right? Their goal has been to try to go around them, envelop them, and press forward. They've ended up having a lot of skirmishes with Ukrainian forces. These are intense fights. And Russian forces have taken, you know, real losses in manpower and material, actually. They had a real bloody nose, I think, in the first several days of this fight. But these battles, these are not major battles. I want to clarify a few. When I see a loss rate of about 10 tanks per day between an active duty military that has 700 tanks and another one that has 2,800 tanks, it gives you a sense that these are not major battles being taking place. This is sustained fighting all across different, you know, sort of parts of Ukraine. Um, so, so my concern is still that Ukrainian forces, if not, they're not going to be immediately isolated and cut off in sectors the way Russian troops hope they, they would be able to achieve via these thunder runs. That's clearly a shot strategy. And logistically, I thought completely unworkable. Now they're going to pinch away slowly at the territory, but still parts of that front are going to, you know, they're, they're, they're undoubtedly going to have to retreat. Um, you know, the, 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 the ter terrible nature of how logistics were organized for this operation is the biggest thing that's hampering the Russian military now. Uh, and then the big question is, what's going to happen around uh, around Kiev? Are they going to attempt a major siege, siege and urban assault? That's the that's the most worrisome part that, that that I'm looking at for the next couple of days. It looks like they're setting up for that. Uh, so on this position, Ukrainian forces they've held. They're organized in regional commands that can be relatively independent. I think they've also lost a substantial amount of material, but the uh, poor planning and execution of the initial operation has given them the ability to generate forces, get reserves, get more people in. So it's actually bought Ukrainian military and Ukrainian defense a lot of time, right? And, and Ukrainian civilians actually realize that, hey, you can turn away a lot of Russian tanks with a civilian crowd on the roads. A lot of these units are being pushed out of small detachments. Russian units are not operating as battalion tactical groups. They're not engaging in combined arms formations. Well, very few of them are. And small detachments are entering cities, and in some places, even a group of civilians can turn away a, a group of tanks, because many of these Russian soldiers are not, uh, despite, despite some of the fighting you've seen, you definitely see some of them are not eager to fire on civilians. Paul, Paul, you're muted. muted. Thank you. Two years of COVID, still don't have it. Um, uh, Michael, do you find... Uh, credible reports that of poor Mush Russian morale of uh, of uh, surrendering of, of soldiers and units, uh, or is that part of information warfare? No, um, they're credible. Uh, they're very uneven. I've definitely seen Russian units. R Russian morale in general isn't high. It's very good. Russian Russian units in general don't don't see Ukrainians as their opponents, and and this is a war that they're psychologically prepared for. It's clear that a lot of commanders got their orders very late into the run up of the preparations when they were pushed to the border, and that main soldiers didn't know they were going to be conducting this kind of operation. One second, uh, you definitely see that the effect is compounded by the fact that Russian units at first were sent ahead in these small detachments, which were easily cut off, and then the troops essentially give up their vehicles or abandon them. And, and logistics aren't organized in the Russian military to support that kind of advance. It's just not a military that's set up for, for uh, this type of campaign to do it this way. And so troops were readily abandoning their vehicles. In, in a couple of particular sectors by, by Kharkiv and Sumy, I've definitely seen smaller cases of desertions. It's very clear that units have left their equipment and there's nothing wrong with their equipment. So, but that's not the same story in the North and the South. I wanna be clear that we do see low morale, um, we do see cases of, of lower level kind of desertion, but it's uneven. Um, and looking north of, north of Kiev, that's a very large column, and it has a lot of Kadyrovsky in it as well, Chechens. 
um, that are technically part of Russian Rose Guardia that are in that column. And I've seen uh, a lot of footage of them and uh, those people have high morale. Let's put it this way. Um, so that's at least that's at least the one part of, of the urban assault effort where I it's the one it's the one element of the Russian force that I suspect isn't going to lose its morale very fast. Yeah, though I also know that they're not fighting in Chechnya. They're not at home they're in strange land. Um, hey, Sarah, hey, one question, one more question for you, and then I will turn over the mic to uh, to Maria. Uh, Sarah, hey, how dependent is the risk? You know, I mean, you spoke eloquently about the, the high morale and the spirit and, and what what Putin thought was going to be a brittle sense of identity or a superficial sense of Ukrainian identity actually being much deeper, stronger than he expected. Uh, we can talk about intelligence failures on the Russian side uh, separately, but how how dependent do you believe that that morale and resistance is on a possession of Kiev and, and Kharkiv and B on the survival of Zelensky uh, and his government? Uh, well, uh, Kiev is extremely important. Kiev is extremely important as ultimate prize, of course, for Vladimir Putin, the way how, at least historically, he framed the, the, the cause for the war uh, on Ukraine and against Ukraine. Um, and uh, Zelensky, the, who was not important one week ago, became an extremely important symbol of resistance. And uh, that uh, role that he played within the last week turned out, in my opinion, to be really crucial. Uh, but once that role has been played, uh, I think that, um, again, the, the importance of, of that symbol of resistance is, is uh, becoming less, less crucial for the continuation of the Ukrainian resistance. So that, that first week was really, was really very important. Um, Kharkiv, uh, I suspect that uh, one of the reasons why there is a real, that they're fighting for two city, cities or trying to get into two cities for sure, this is Kiev and Kharkiv. And Kharkiv, uh, historically, that was part of the, uh, the, the, not just part, it was the capital of Soviet Ukraine in the 1920s. That's, that's how the Bolsheviks took control over Ukraine and created the, the capital of that Soviet Ukraine close to their borders. So I, I assume that if um, they, they eventually get, get to Kharkiv and establish control there, they, they can use that to um, uh, put forward some kind of a, either puppet government or, or, or uh, Yunukovych, if again, this is the, the, the reporting that was happening today uh, is correct. Uh, but overall, again, all of these are important things, Kharkiv, uh, Kiev and Zelensky, but after uh, being able to resist for one week, the Ukrainians, the most important part is that they got this uh, uh, really uh, uh, belief that they can continue the resistance. So that, that, that week was, whatever happens later was, was the most important part, the most important week of the war. Thank you, Sergei. Maria, let me turn over the mic over to you. We've got 60 different questions already. <laughs> Absolutely, and that doesn't include the ones that were organically answered by the panelists, which I've been filtering out. So thank you everyone for your questions. We had several questions come in on the subject of better understanding the Russian people, Russian civilians, Russian military, and their perspective on this and their role in this. So the first of these questions is for Sergei, as to whether you have any insight on the conduct and behavior of the Russian minority in Ukraine while the conflict is unfolding. And then we have some questions more about Russian soldiers, mostly for Kevin and Michael, um, including what is the makeup of the Russian army of professional soldiers versus conscripts? Are a lot of the soldiers going into Ukraine conscripts? Uh, has the West overestimated Russia's conventional military capabilities or is stating it differently? Have we had accurate NATO and Western assessments of the Russian military in the years leading up to this conflict? And then finally, if there was a popular misconception about Russia's military, you'd want to set straight, what would it be? Uh, thank you. So should I start with this question that was addressed to me? Um, the question of the Russian minority. 
um, there was uh, before the events of 2014, before the annexation of the Crimea, there was one region in Ukraine where Russians constituted the majority, and that was the Crimea. With the annexation of the Crimea, Ukraine became a much more homogeneous place in, in many ways. And uh, uh, the uh, Russian language or Russian culture are still dominant in the East and in the South, but there is no per se ethnic divisions or ethnic differences in that sense. Uh, Russian serves as, a, or Ukrainian for that matter, serves as, as a language that both groups, groups use. So that is one of the reasons why we really don't see this time around any, any, any sort of mobilization or any sort of attraction uh, when it comes to the uh, Putin's idea of bringing Ruski Mir or the Russian world to, to Ukraine. And uh, Ukrainians like it was done in 2014, now it's even more true they mobilize across the uh, linguistic and cultural and religious lines in the country in which the main, the, the majority of the population, overwhelming majority of population, I think Ukrainians, the biggest hero as of today is a Jewish president of Ukraine. His minister of defense is also of Jewish background. And uh, 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 from that point of view, again, Russians of Ukraine are as much on the side of the Ukrainian state as, as, as are Ukrainians, or at least uh, there, is no, there is no repetition of 2014, so it's not an issue. There are, there are cracks emerging now within the Russian, uh, within the Orthodox Church under the jurisdiction of Moscow, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the jurisdiction of Moscow today. A number of priests were uh, demanding demanding the autocephaly and independence of the Orthodox Church from from Moscow. Uh, so mm, again, uh, the, 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 this is this is the reaction that uh, certainly I don't think that the uh, Putin and his advisors expected. Ukraine is united as 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 it probably ever been in the in the course of the last 100 years. It's, it's almost amazing. Thank you. So, do you want me to jump in, Maria? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> my experience with the Russian military people, the soldiers, the officers, has been very personal throughout my career from the uh, 1980s when I was in Berlin and driving around East Germany and and looking at the Russians train in the field there, that was our job at the US military liaison mission. Um, I was there with them when the Soviet Union fell and they were wet, scratching their heads and wondering, what am I now? Am I a Ukrainian military officer? Am I a Russian military officer or something else? Um, and then through the nineties uh, in Moscow, uh, when the officers on the general staff would run two duty rosters, one when they uh, had to be on duty and the other was when they had time off scheduled for the taxi drivers, et cetera, because they weren't getting paid. Um, and then in lately uh, uh, with the ELDA group who are retired uh, uh, military and intelligence, four stars, three stars who, who are patriots to their country, uh, very conservative, and but, but uh, can talk with their American counterparts about uh, what's going on. Um, and through all of this, there were a lot of things that were, uh, um, I guess, traditional might not be the right word, but they were uh, something that uh, characterized the Russian military uh, throughout many decades. And that's the, uh, the fact that uh, these officers are professional. Um, the, the troops are, you know, occasional, that the, the troops flow in and out of uh, Russian military much more quickly and uh, they're not really considered uh, long-term uh, military uh, assets. Uh, but the officers are, and they, uh, uh, they are professional. They, are, they understand the military art, art and science, but they live in a very corrupt context. And so how they behave and how they act has to uh, take that into account. And you get that all the way up until about 2008. And we have this thing called the New Look Reforms. The Russians have been trying to reform the military all along, but 
but these new look reforms really were a step up and forward for them. And they made their military smaller. Um, they made it uh, better resourced. They took from the reserves, et cetera, and gave to the, uh, to the active duty. So uh, I, looking at that with my experience was thinking, well, that, th this is a far better Russian military now. Uh, they are much more capable, even dangerous in the near abroad. And look what they're doing in Syria and so on. Uh, I had a very high regard for them. But uh, that regard is greatly tempered now for all the reasons that Michael laid out so well uh, after watching these initial few days in, uh, in Ukraine. A lot of problems. The conscript uh, thing is still a big problem for the Russian military. Uh, about a third to a fourth of their military at any time is conscript. That means somebody who was brought in less than a year ago and has one year to spend in the military. And, you know, that kind of a soldier, he's not going to be told what the uh, plan is, you know, where we're going. He just, you know, drive straight ahead, follow that truck in front of you. And that's, uh, that is a, um, a vulnerability to the Russian military. So when these guys get someplace to it where there's nobody left to tell them what to do, they do exactly what Michael noted. They get out of their trucks, they start walking backwards, and and we've seen that in in uh, in Ukraine. So that's that's what I think about the soldiers and the military professionals. Hey, Kevin, just a quick quick follow up, um, and I, I I suspect a lot of folks will have thought about this, seeing the pictures. Um, you know, this this forty mile long convoy uh, outside yeah. of uh, Kiev. Uh, looks to me like a target-rich environment. Do, does Ukraine simply not have uh, capability to interdict or to uh, or to disrupt or to degrade uh, that, that uh, that's big my, sitting duck target? Yeah, that's my best guess. I actually don't know why it hasn't been shot at. Maybe it is being, but we don't know it. Um, I I do the similar kinds of you know social media scans that Michael was talking about there. Uh, there are plenty of videos of destroyed Russian columns and, and convoys uh, in the social media, but apparently that's not happening up in the north. I, I, I credit the Russians for that. You know, they must either be doing something better or they must have better control or security or I don't know. Michael, any th thoughts on that? Um, so just generally adding to colleagues' remarks, Military has improved dramatically, much more contract-based force, okay? Still requires conscript support, as Kevin said. Of the forces deployed, even if you assume that 120 battalion tactical groups, which are contract staff, that's about 90,000 troops, right? So out of 190,000, maybe at most 90,000 are probably really contract men, then the rest are, are probably a mix. And we've seen that the way they plus up their numbers is there are conscripts in this force supporting, particularly logistics and tail. And they also brought in some reservists as well. Here's an important thing. First, Russia's never attempted a campaign this large since the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? 190,000 troop deployment to invade the largest country in Europe, okay? Uh, this is clearly in terms of organization, capability, logistics capacity, and undertaking that while they're attempting it, at first blush, appears a little bit beyond uh, uh, beyond the uh, capability. So, my own view of it was I was always a person that after 2014 was saying, look, I'm really glad we're now looking at the Russian military, obviously parochially as a Russian military analyst um, and anybody in a subfield of, of studies uh, suddenly suddenly gets excited about the fact that, you know, their field gets tension and relevance. But I was always like saying the initial reaction was, oh, no, Russians might be 12 feet tall. Right. I'm worried that after this initial performance, the reaction we're going to get is that Russians are four feet tall and both are wrong. Right. The truth is definitely somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's leading me to reassess certain things I believe about the Russian military, but I will tell you, we need a lot more time to assess which of the problems are structural. I see some problems with basics due to corruption, for example, provision of food and supplies that are enduring in the Russian military, right? And maybe a lot less corrupt than it was in the 90s and 2000s, but there's still clear core issues there, foundational issues. And which are problems are really driven by the operation. There are parts of this operation where you look at it and you can't imagine any military being able to execute an unworkable concept of operations with political aims and assumptions that aren't, they're just not real well grounded in reality. And the military somehow be able to deliver on this on a timetable that makes no sense. Clearly Vladimir Putin wanted them to essentially defeat the largest country in Europe in a handful of days. 
and without a significant amount of planning and also without using most of their capabilities right so you basically see how how parts of those operations in, inherently um as other colleagues looking at is an ir irrational force employment literally an irrational use of forces and a, and a bizarre approach in parts of the operation and i said before I, I think in the last two days, we've seen that slowly change and we're gonna see it change a lot, unfortunately, to, to a rational use of forces by the Russian military. That's going to be quite devastating. Unfortunately, that's an excellent segue, that last part, to a bunch of questions we've had coming in about what's next. Uh, we've had several questions asking, essentially, what is Putin's off ramp? Are there options the West could provide uh, that would allow him to save face and exit, or would he even be willing to consider that? And then on the flip side of that, uh, should we be scared of nuclear weapons being used? Um, and then two other possible endpoints that questioners were asking about, what are the prospects for some sort of military coup or other internal dissent against Putin to try to destabilize him? And finally, is it possible that what we'll see is some sort of or of attrition or a situation where the Russian military is bogged down in Ukraine um, with the Ukrainians unable to push them out, but not letting them completely take over and end the conflict. So essentially what's next? What can we anticipate? Yeah, I can I can briefly start just to say um, first, yeah, I don't think nuclear weapons are gonna get used. I certainly hope not, but we are, I am looking at a chasm of uncertainty. You know, I mean, we're, we're really on a chart terrain in terms of how this crisis has evolved. And I'm not talking about necessarily the, the Russian uh, war in Ukraine. I was one of the folks that probably spent three or four months writing that I thought this was very likely going to happen. Um, although I'm surprised by, by how it's un, unfolding. But the, the real issue is the crisis between Russia, the United States, and the West. I mean, a lot of these sanctions and the way political support rapidly mobilized. Um, was unexpected even by the most ardent advocates of sanctions, right? Sanctions against the central the Russian central bank's ability to use its reserves to, to bail out the economy and the like. So this is a catastrophe for the Russian economy. I mean, very frank. Um, I, I think it's a, I think in many ways it's a cataclysmic event that what they've done. It's 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 an immense miscalculation by Putin. I uh, have never been a person who makes like proclamations or a lot of predictions. It's terrible for analysts to just make predictions all the time. But I honestly think that we're now at the beginning of might be the end of that regime. I don't understand how that person is long term going to hold on to power after this, the way this situation is developing. Not necessarily because of what's happening in Ukraine, just because of what 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 this gambit has done to Russia itself. Right. And this this will lead to my last point, which is I think it does unfortunately cut off a lot of options in Ukraine because any political regime that threatens is not going to be able to afford to lose. Because if there's also humiliating defeat in Ukraine on top of the situation that's placed Russia in now, I, I don't see, I, yeah, I don't really see a future for Vladimir Putin. That's my own personal view. And of course, as always, you know, I could be advancing the desirable for the actual, but that's um, that's the way I've been looking at it over the last couple of days. This is the first time that I really started to think that that this regime isn't going to hold. And I don't think because of grassroots protests, I think as always somebody in the elite will will maybe replace him or maybe he'll get the Nikita Khrushchev retirement package or something like that, but still. The Joseph Stalin retirement package. There are variations. Yeah. Well, I, I maybe will uh, comment a little bit on nuclear and I agree with, with Michael's assessment that really um, that that is highly unlikely that that was a response to, to sanctions and the unity of, of the West, uh, what happened there, and also a warning not, not to get directly involved in, in Ukraine. But there is a, a one a part, a component of that nuclear threat that, or, or a different nuclear threat that is very real. And uh, on the second day of the, of the uh, invasion, or maybe it was even the first day, uh, people in unmarked uniforms took over control over the Chernobyl nuclear uh, power plant, whatever is left of it, this uh, new um, sarcophagus or the new shelter, uh, 1.5 billion euro uh, worth shelter. 
and uh, uh, kept uh, uh, as hostage the personnel, the Ukrainian personnel that were there maintaining those facilities. It was only one day later that it was the Russian uh, um, um, Ministry of Defense uh, uh, admitted that those were those were uh, Russian soldiers, and they put forward this very implausible story that they, together with the uh, Ukrainian military, um, exercised in this kind of a joint uh, patrolling of, of the area to to, to secure it. Um, the um, radiation levels went up in the in the exclusion zone. It was not clear why originally. The Ukrainian explanation today is that the main reason was the tanks and heavy equipment and so on and so forth was moving through the zone, including through its one of the most dirty dirty parts and areas, and the the um, radioactive dust. Went 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 in, into the air and contributed to that to that development. Uh, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant, with six operating reactors, is right uh, on the Russian way from the Crimea, further to the to, to central Ukraine. The Russian troops are already on uh, on the outskirts uh, at the gates of the. Um, that city, the city is called Enerhodar. Uh, the people in the city mobilized and uh, basically created blocks and went to talk to the military saying that they don't want them, they don't want them in, in the city. This is a report coming from today. Apparently the Russians didn't, didn't move into the city. Uh, but again, we are talking about, about the um, war zone, we are talking about the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, and we talk about really uh, at least ambiguity about who is who is in the control of the area and who is in, in the control of what is going on uh, there. So there are daily reports to the International Atomic Energy um, uh, Agency, uh, they express concern, they probably talk to, to Different parties, they for the first few days, they wouldn't pronounce word Russia uh, and were calling to all parties involved to, to um, restrain. Ukrainian government asks uh, the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency to facilitate the implementation of 30 kilometer exclusion zone around every nuclear power plant. And that, in that context, exclusion zone is about no military forces. Uh, within within 30 uh, kilometers from a nuclear power plant, but again, that was that was the Ukrainian proposal. I don't know whether um, th there was any traction, whether there was any response. So the, the nuclear um, uh, nuclear component is very much part of, of uh, that war, and not in the way that most people know about and are concerned. About. So uh, I think those are great uh, comments about the nuclear situation. I I actually subscribe to both Sergey and Michael's opinion on the likelihood of that. But since they've both taken the uh, option to explain how that's unlikely, I'll I'll go ahead and present the Karen view or the uh, uh, the opposite uh, view of why we should be worried about uh, nuclear weapons there. And um, and then you've got a, a plus and a minus uh, to choose from. Uh, uh, I I would go back to Michael's description of the um, sanctions. You know, unprecedented. They clearly threaten the survival of the regime uh, and the whole country, but the regime for sure. Um, and by going after the central bank and devaluating uh, uh, the ruble, the and closing the stock market, et cetera, um, you start to hurt uh, or, or limit the ability of the country to even fund itself, to fund its own military, to fund uh, the, uh, the continued production of the uh, weapons and uh, precision weapons that they're trying to use in, in the war. So, so this is uh, from the perspective of Putin and the Russian leadership, this is a real threat to the regime. And in all of their doctrine, all of their uh, national security statement uh, or national security uh, uh, documents, they say that clearly that uh, a threat 
that uh, to the survival of the regime is a reason why they might elect to use nuclear weapons. So, so the opportunity is there, the reason is there. Uh, the question is, would they do it? Why would they do it? How could they do it? I'll, I'll give you a, pro, um, a supposed scenario. Uh, if the Russian military is not doing well, if they do not look like they will accomplish their goals, if Putin looks like he may lose credibility and standing in, in the country because of the way the military operation is going, if he uses a small tactical nuclear weapon as a demonstration, uh, people have written about escalating to de-escalate. Uh, if he uses a small nuclear explosion, say somewhere on the territory of Ukraine, or he could move it off into the Black Sea and explode it on a naval uh, uh, flotilla where it has uh, very little impact on civilians and civilian structures. But in any case, if he uses it, it makes the uh, nuclear uh, deterrent real. It puts it on TV. It puts it in front of everybody uh, around the world. And it shows that Russia is not afraid to use it. It rejuvenates their deterrent, the, the deterrent value of those nuclear weapons. I think in some parts of the world today, and uh, many people think, oh, nuclear weapons would never, they're too you know, horrific. Uh, nobody really is going to use those weapons. Uh, that They lose a little of their deterrent value when that kind of conversation happens. So, um, it is possible that a nuclear weapon may be the thing that he selects. I'll close with, you know, the, the, on the nuclear weapon that we made that decision once. It's really a binary, simple decision when you make it. Am I better off to use a nuclear weapon than not? That's the whole thought process. And uh, if, if only a madman will use a nuclear weapon, well, was Harry Truman a madman? I don't think so. So it's a possibility. It's not a, a likelihood, but it's a, a scary possibility. Thank you all for addressing that alarming prospect and providing the two sides of that and what it could look like. Uh, we have been getting many more questions than we can answer, but we do have a few minutes left. So I wanted to address a question that's come up a few times about China. So the bigger geopolitical situation, are the questions I'm seeing include um, whether China is likely to have taken lessons for Taiwan or whether China is likely to make a move on Taiwan, whether the West would um, trade, trade that situation, potentially forego Taiwan for the sake of China's help in, um, in addressing the Russian threat. Um, and then connected to that, whether China is, has the potential to serve a mediating role and help de-escalate in the current Russian conflict. Can I jump in first? Because I know the least about China of anybody on this Zoom. All right, the only thing I will point out is that Russia and China's militaries have grown more and more intertwined and they, they do more and more things together. The Chinese have been part of every annual exercise since 2018, except for this most recent Zapad exercise. Uh, they've been doing joint, uh, joint exercises since 2005 with the Russian military. They do joint patrols in the Pacific, air patrols, uh, their navies. Uh, so so they, are, uh, they, are, they, are, they don't call themselves an alliance, but they're as close to that as you can get uh, without. And what China might do, I have no earthly idea. Okay, I can maybe then I'll, 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 I'll comment on that. Um, uh, well, uh, China is extremely important because I uh, really can't imagine the current situation and uh, this dramatic worsening of relations between Russia and, and the West if uh, Russia would have nowhere to go if it would be still a bipolar world. There is in many ways a tripolar or tripolar world today and this getting closer to, to China and hoping for assistance from there is an important part of this calculation and important part of this war, at least the way how I imagine it. 
Um, uh, uh, the China's position so far was on the one hand support of Russia on certain issues, but certainly not full support. And uh, uh, China is very reluctant to um, uh, recognize the, the uh, violation of the territorial uh, integrity and sovereignty of the state. So sovereignty is really a very important part of of that story. So there is no 100% support of, of Russia and there is some reservations on many levels, which suggests that under certain circumstances, China can play a role in, in uh, uh, maybe as an intermediary or in some other way in resolution of this conflict. Uh, I, I certainly would, uh, would uh, keep that in mind as part of, of thinking and as part of, of operations for the future, given already publicly publicly declared uh, policy of, of, you know, of Beijing, supporting in one way, but not supporting in another way of what Russia is doing in Ukraine today. And just to, to add, not that it matters much for the, for the Chinese economy, but for Ukraine, China, um, certainly before this, this war, was the largest partner. Again, not as big as the European Union, but if you think about the countries rather, rather than, than you know, uh, groups of countries like the European Union, it was the largest. Thank you both very much. Michael, did you want to add on the China? Uh, I don't know what China is going to do. I don't think it's going to invade Taiwan because Russia invaded Ukraine. There's not a logical connection there. And, you know, I mean, as always, countries like China look at how this conflict plays out. Most importantly, they look at the kind of sanctions the United States impose and what the response is. But people often want to draw very quick, you know, connections between this and any other geopolitical confrontation or crisis. And you have to be very careful because you're often taking things out of the context and the situation you're in. And then trying to generalize them to something else. And so you're stripping away the entire context of the situation and just assuming generalizability. And there's always things you can take out of that, but you know, you're 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 also reasoning, you're also reasoning in part by analogy, and it often takes you down the wrong road too. So that's why I say be careful, be careful with that. All right, we've got just a couple of minutes left, and I'm gonna ask incredibly unfair, but I hope will be really uh, entertaining and, and I think informative question. Um, so this think about this as a lightning round. Uh, you've each been uh, transmogrified into being Henry Kissinger, and you're on your way to conduct shuttle diplomacy. And you've got some scribbled notes on an envelope in back of your pocket, which has the outlines of a peace plan. What does that look like? And I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about it. You know, what are the three elements of it? And uh, give me a couple minutes, uh, a couple seconds to think about it, and then I'm going to cold call somebody. And I'll start with Kevin. Okay. So, uh, first thing on it is a ceasefire. Uh, because I'm from the West, uh, the second thing on it is uh, uh, freezing of forces where they are with the um, promise that forces will go back to their own country at the conclusion of whatever treaty we're gonna come up with. Um, and uh, the third thing would be uh, a commitment to non-interference and a recommitment to the, basically the Budapest, uh, uh, you know, rules, non-interference in the two countries. Okay. I'll stop. Yeah. Michael. Um, yeah, so naturally a ceasefire and then a, a political process whereby you have Russian troop withdrawal, that withdrawal is also tied to some sort of maybe annual referendum on what happens in the Donbass itself, a future status of the Donbass, uh, and then something regarding Ukraine's uh, orientation. It could be just political statements of uh, that maybe Ukraine will, could be in the EU, but it would be uh, neutral in terms of its alliance pursuit. I don't know. I, I'm not sure where the Venn diagrams really intersect between Russian maximal aims and what yeah. Ukraine can offer at this point. I'll be very honest. I am deeply skeptical that a deal is going to be made here. And I think there is going to be uh, an assault on, on Kiev. And, and only after that will we, will we actually see more serious discussions. But I'll, I, I'm not seeing a strong intersection here. Sorry, just to be like very pessimistic about 
the likelihood of a negotiated solution in the coming days. Great. Yeah, I didn't put a time frame on it, but uh, no, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it may take some time for the, those Venn diagrams to come together. And Sergei, last word to you. Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, I would check whether those notes are not coming from Chamberlain. Um, uh, and uh, then probably uh, I would, I would, if I was Kissinger, I would look at the article that Kissinger published a few years ago, where he was uh, very specific in, in, in what he suggested as a solution, and that was the neutral status for Ukraine. So probably Kissinger would still work on that on, on that assumption. I don't know whether he changed his mind or not, but he went public, uh, stating that. Uh, but uh, going beyond Chamberlain and Kissinger, I would certainly uh, ally myself with Kevin and Michael in, in a sense that, yes, there has to be a ceasefire first. And I also don't think that the meaningful negotiations will happen until the, Russia will try whatever forces it has in the, in the region and see how far it can get. Gentlemen. Maria, thank you very much uh, for uh, a discussion, which uh, certainly on my part could go on for uh, hours longer. And we've had some similar comments from, from folks in the audience. I really appreciate your insights. Appreciate the uh, amount of time and attention that you're putting on this and the, and the, and the need for your expertise. Um, and I just want to end with a note of, of uh, uh, um, hopefulness that somehow, as difficult as it is to see right now, that a way out of this will be found that a spiral of escalation and increasing violence can be avoided. Um, but I do fear that we face some very dark days and some very dangerous challenges. Uh, but with that, I'll just close with uh, Slava Ukraini. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.